Welcome to this uh, presentation about cloud computing in general and uh, a little bit about the strategies behind a move to the cloud and uh, sort of what do you do with the cloud to optimize your business scenarios. We will be uh, talking today about roughly what is the cloud. I think honestly that most of you know what the cloud is. But what I mean by that is that I'm going to um, exemplify using the uh, Azure platform, the Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Azure platform, and I'm going to talk more about the Azure platform as well during this presentation. But I'm also going to hint to you guys how do you, how do you actually get going with this, how, what is the way to get started. Now, I don't know much about you guys at all. I roughly know what the focus group of this presentation should be. So let's hope that uh, you guys are people who are maybe not so deep into tech, maybe more on a project manager, strategic, or any, any uh, leading roles uh, in your company. Because if you are a very deep dive technologist, probably this presentation will not be extremely fun for you. But if you are someone who, in, who, are in, who is in charge of, of of strategic decisions and business decisions and uh, maybe on a top te technical level, then this, this presentation should serve you well. Uh, if you have any questions, just uh, uh, ask them in the chat and my co-host today, Jay, will be able to uh, help you guys. Speaking of co-host, by the way, uh, you can introduce yourself. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Magnus. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to join the today's session. Uh, actually, my colleague was about to join Pratik today, but due to his bad health, he was unable to join. So let me give you a brief introduction about Radix. Uh, we are an organization established since last 15 years. Uh, we have done somewhere around 1,500 plus software projects. And at present, we are holding a 350 plus employee strength and located in India. Uh, we are a Microsoft Gold Partner for software development and web development. We are certified as an ISO certification. Uh, in terms of our service lines, we are offering uh, uh, IT consulting and software development for web, mobile, and desktop. Uh, we are also looking after with some with couple of uh, software product companies and working as their uh, uh, force to develop their software applications, starting from the idea stage to the delivery of the application uh, till the customer support. We are also working with a couple of uh, software product companies in terms of uh, modernizing their legacy applications and moving it to cloud as well as uh, uh, coming up with the latest uh, offering strategy. Uh, for cloud-based development, we are working with uh, uh, Magnus and we are doing quite a good things with him on Azure side. And we are also helping out to a couple of organizations in terms of their application maintenance and providing the regular ongoing support. So this was just a very brief about what Radix is all about and what we do. Uh, I will hand over the line to Magnus to further give you more insights about uh, cloud computing technologies and Azure. Hand over to you, Magnus. Super. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect. Okay. So then very briefly also, who am I? Well, I'm Magnus Martinson. I'm based out of Sweden where I run my company called LoftySoft. It's uh, focused uh, entirely on um, strategic and architectural, even coding uh, for the cloud, for the Azure platform specifically. I was the first uh, MVP to become um, Azure MVP in the Nordic countries uh, and I'm also what Microsoft would like to call a regional director which means that I'm a sort of a close strategic partner to Microsoft that I, we share a lot of, of, of common business. So I've been around the cloud since like day one and uh, I have lots and lots of experience uh, working with many types of customers on the cloud. That's basically me. So if you have any questions at all now or after this presentation, don't hesitate to send me an email. That's perfectly fine. I just want to call out also maybe uh, quickly that the Global Azure Boot Camp is a very cool event. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, uh, you should direct uh, developers and, and uh, community enthusiasts to it. It's a one-day uh, one event every year where uh, people meet up uh, on the same day, on the same Earth revolution, if you will, starting from Australia, ending up in Hawaii, uh, thousands of people online at the same time. It's a very cool event. All right. Moving on, what is the cloud? What is the actual cloud? Well, the actual cloud, as you all probably know, 
are data centers spread out throughout the world. These are the Azure ones, the Microsoft Azure ones. I don't know if it's 19 or 20 or 21 at this time. Uh, this, this number keeps going up. Uh, the more and more data centers are added. At any one of these dots on the map, you will have a big data center or a cluster of, of buildings with lots and lots and lots of compute power in them. Uh, you know, in the range of at least set, definitely tens, uh, maybe even 100,000 physical servers, and then they virtualize on top of that, giving you an extreme amount of power to, to utilize. Now, the big question, of course, is what does this cloud computing thing bring that is new, that is different from what we had before the cloud? Why are we all talking about this now? I find it good to go to definitions at, at point, times like these. And of course, there is a really good cloud computing definition made by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. I urge you actually to download and read this. It's a seven-page document, but it's only like three pages of text. It's a really, really good and focused um, description of what defines public cloud or cloud computing. What is it? Because if you are uh, thinking about buying or purchasing some um, cloud compute or, or some, some cloud offering from, from a vendor, they might tell you that they have a cloud offering, but in truth, that might not be exactly what it is. It's just something, it's it maybe a really good data center that they like to call cloud. But cloud has a few, few um, uh, you know, points that they have to actually tick off all of these five things to be able to call it a public cloud, and many do not reach all the way. So on the resource pooling side, um, this picture it intends to show that it's great to have a, a huge pool of, of shared compute resources because if nothing else, it's actually green computing if you think about it because these huge data centers are the most energy efficient, most supercharged, uh, easy to manage, biggest data centers that exist. And there is no way that you could run uh, a, a your own data center cheaper or more efficient than what these guys can. If you think you can, you should probably call one of them because they'd probably like to hire you. So actually making a, a green decision for a company is to not invest in a new purchase of an on-premise server farm. Instead, go to a cloud vendor and, and jump in the big pool. That will give you lots of other positive things as well such as, for instance, rapid elasticity, which is a really, really good feature of the cloud, meaning that you can uh, elastically scale your server farm from uh, on low, um, low um, pressure, maybe using, you know, 10 or something servers. If you have, like, a huge campaign running where you suddenly, for, like, uh, a couple of days, need 500 servers, it's not a problem at all. You can get those 500 servers for, the, for your campaign only and then return them to the pool when you're done with them and you'll only pay for, for the part that you used. So I actually want to show you just quick in the Azure portal, this is the Microsoft Azure portal, the preview portal, um, where I have some resources. I wanted to show you that I just deployed a um, website, it's a very simple website just for demo purposes that I wanted to show you today. And the first thing I'm going to show you here inside of the portal uh, when this thing loads up is that I can hit the scale button. And um, it's right here uh, in front of us. It's loading. I'm pointing to the one I want, this one. When I click the scale tile here, I come into my scale settings for my website. And as you can see here, I can scale from like one to up to 10 instances uh, of, of a web farm, and that will give me an automated load balanced web farm of 10 web servers running my, my code. But I can also do more interesting things like maybe jump over to CPU and say that I would like to have CPU uh, goes above 85%. Stuff like that is, is completely possible to do, automatic scaling, leaving your site responsive at all times, uh, while at the same time, since you're automatically scaling, you're saving money because you're scaling in, you're removing instances when you don't use them, and you're adding instances when you need them. So that's a very powerful feature of the cloud. And I hinted already at the measured service feature of, or a 
you know, capacity of the cloud where uh, Microsoft or, or the, your cloud vendor will know exactly how much you use every month so that they will send you a very detailed bill of everything you've used. Uh, servers are measured down to a per minute billing. So if you run a server for one minute, you will pay for one minute of server time. Um, and that's, that's good for Microsoft, I suppose, but it's also very, very good for you because it leads to the fact that you will pay only for what you use. You won't pay for anything else at all. It's even gone so far as to have your bill, not Bill Gates, but your, your uh, monthly bill say that if, if you added auto scale to your, your uh, web farm, you would save this much money every month if you haven't added it already. That's pretty powerful. Um, and and um, I wanted to show you also one way to start thinking about the cost of your uh, web uh, or, or your Azure deployment is to go to azure.com and click on pricing. You would get this, um, this calculator where you can say like so things like, well, I want to have a web application. It should have a database and we need some storage. Uh, and then you can add those things to your calculator. I set it to euros here in this case, but, but there are many other uh, currencies that you could use if you uh, want to make uh, deals or, or have business with Microsoft in your own currency. So um, here we have, in this example, we have a server. Let's go to a standard size server, maybe two instances. Let's go to, uh, well, I put that in West US and that in East US, but it doesn't matter for this example. It should all be located at the same place. Let's add a database to that and, you know, let's do two terabytes of storage or something like that. You can play around in here and make sort of a rough sketch of your architecture to be in the cloud and then start thinking about what that's going to cost you each month uh, to, to run this. And this is sort of an example to show that. The Azure calculator. Now, another really good thing, and I've already told you this, is this, this on-demand self-service feature. You will uh, press the, the gas pump to, to, and pay for the amount of um, resource you need at any given time. The good thing is that when you need more resources, you can press harder and get, you know, well, I suppose you need to pay more, right? But you will automatically also get more uh, power. But the most powerful thing about that is that you can just let it down to a small, small trickle when you don't need it anymore and, and run on very small instances. That's not, definitely not going to cost you much at all. And that's a very, very important part of it. So that's the basics, the, 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 the cloud basics that sort of uh, the, the promise that you get if you want to start using the cloud. Um, moving on to um, the cloud computing patterns. Why would you use this stuff then? Well, based on the, on the NIST definition that I just showed you, this is a really powerful uh, option for you. The on and off pattern for compute. This is perfect when you're doing development and testing. When you have a development and testing team working during the day, you can have test servers and things running in the cloud. And when they go home at night, you can shut all that off and pay absolutely nothing for it. And then when they come back in the office in the morning, you can stand those instances up again and, and continue working. That's a very, very good way of saving money. I know a company, I know a company that have a thousand test servers in their basement. That's literally a thousand machines that they run and maintain in order to do development and testing. Now, they have to, of course, pay for that maintenance always, the power and the staffing and all of that stuff. What they should do is go to the cloud and when it's night time or holiday time or Christmas, they have, not, they have no cost for their uh, development and testing. Well, God forbid you grow fast, right? Because, you know, back in the day, growing fast was lethal. You might, uh, you know, make it big, but you're, you haven't had time to purchase enough compute power, so you're losing business because your IT infrastructure wasn't, wasn't keeping up. At one point, I asked the data center people, guys, um, what, if I, what if I launched 5,000 instances in a data center? Would that, you know, would that be okay with you? Would all of a sudden, I decide to, to launch 5,000 instances? And they just answered calmly, go ahead. They have some power to spare, and uh, that's a really, really important thing when you're growing fast. Also, uh, I'm, I'm old enough to, to know what slash dotting is. 
if you are all of a sudden extremely popular for some reason, you're able to survive those unpredictable bursts and not have a, uh, you know, a denial of service or, or a service disruption exactly when you need it the most because that could be really bad for business. Uh, using the cloud, you can survive those bursts and just say, hey, go to 20 instances, go to 50, go to 1,000. <laughs> and, and, and you can do that by just paying for a few hours. Uh, you can manage. And then uh, what normal utilization or norm, normal usage, usage of, a, um, of a, a system is that you have a predictable curve. You know that maybe Monday through Friday your services are used at a certain level. During the weekends, maybe it's less. And then you can save money on the weekends and scale out again on, the, on, on the Monday. And this is very, very powerful because you pay only for what you use. And if you see this dotted line uh, in the middle here, if you, if you purchased servers, you would have to pay for those servers all the time. You wouldn't be able to catch the peaks and you wouldn't be able to save any money in the valleys. So um, that's what definite great patterns uh, of cloud computing uh, that I know for sure uh, would make you extremely much more efficient. Now, um, cloud computing is, is really, it is inevitable if you ask me. It is absolutely awesome and um, you have to use it because if you make a large investment today and don't think about cloud computing, I honestly think you've shot yourself in the foot and um, you're, uh, that's, a, that's a sackable offense in my book. You have to consider this. And uh, the person on the right is the VP, the senior VP or something like that at Microsoft for, uh, for the cloud, Scott Guthrie. Um, I'm just briefly going to note the uh, technology adoption life cycle that, I'm, that some of you probably know about. Every technology innovation goes through this, this cycle of maybe reaching it to the majority section, some uh, in, uh, innovations and ideas drop into the chasm of despair and, and never make it big. But I know for a fact that Azure Cloud or cloud computing is somewhere here now. We have passed the chasm of despair. Everyone is talking about actually doing cloud now and we are somewhere here in this uh, majority, like 80% portion, the early and the late majority of the market are currently adopting cloud. and. Uh, you don't want to be over here. You want to be in this section, for sure. I know that you know changes are scary, but it's time. Uh, it certainly is time. We have to do it now. Um, so this is sort of the uh, my picture for for scary changes, uh, where you have the automobiles uh, coming down the street without you know a horse in front of them. Really scary stuff. So you might want to mount a horse's head on the front there, so that you're not so scared. <laughs> Something along the lines of nine, plus 90% of new .NET software is actually built for cloud delivery today. If you're creating a new project today, you're going to build it for the cloud. That's just a fact. So if only a small part of these, all of these to the cloud calls that we hear right now will become a reality, this actually means that the cloud is the largest IT migration in history, without a doubt. And to make this even more abundantly clear, Forrester said last year in April that for CIOs, the message is clear. You shift into the driver's seat or others will because the public cloud market is now what, in what they call hypergrowth. Um, there was a curve. All the uh, you know, forecasters were saying that the cloud will adopt at this rate. And all of a sudden, there was a, a bend in the curve and it started to go much faster. The reason was that we didn't realize that companies might start to actually move everything they had to the cloud. You don't have to move everything you have to the cloud. But some companies are doing it, and, and that actually broke the predictions for the cloud growth, uh, and now we're growing even faster. So the top priorities uh, for this year, which is, you know, we're in the half, other half of the, the second half or, or last quarter soon of, of this year, um, this, uh, the, the, the real priorities is information, of course. Uh, I, I suppose you know that data is the new oil. And the company that is able to process data fastest will, will win. And a good way to do that is to use Azure resources, use cloud resources. Mobility, of course, with all of those bring your own device uh, scenarios and the Internet of Things. Probably won't have time to talk a lot about the Internet of Things today, but it's extremely important. And it, I mean, it's a whole presentation in its own uh, sense. 
but uh, mobility is the new normal. And uh, the way to explain that is to uh, look at this graph of desktop PC sales over time. We all know that desktop PC sales have gone down in favor of notebook PCs, which has taken over. But the thing, the thing is that, sure, we're selling desktop, desktops and notebooks still, but tablets look like this. These are mobile people who are not at all stationary. They don't even have a full-blown PC. They have a tablet only uh, or, a, or a smartphone or something like that. And, and they expect to reach all the resources that we have in our company. So uh, honestly, we know for a fact that mobile is the new normal. It really is. Now, cloud. That is the third top priority. It is the game changer. That's disruptive technology. That makes your competitive advantage more attainable. And, and you can, you know, it doesn't matter how small your company is. It doesn't matter how big it is. I have never seen a scenario where an on-premise uh, solution or, or a tech spec or, or architecture uh, based on, on total cost of ownership could be the cloud equivalent. It's, it's just not happening. Um, so, so really, this is disruptive technology, and we all have to be here. Um, IT professionals concur. The cloud will completely overtake on-premises. And it's, it's just a matter of, of fact. The biggest thing you can do in the cloud is multi-tenant software. The multi-tenant factor is, is extremely important when you think about it. Multi-tenancy is um, running a service for your customers rather than building, uh, unboxing and shipping a product to maybe 200 customers, each one having an instance of your, your product running. That, that, makes, that gives you a lot of maintenance and support, and um, the big giants are not doing it anymore. Look at Google. They never were on-premises. They were always in the cloud or, you know, whatever that was before it was called cloud. Uh, with maybe Google Apps for your domain, it's multi-tenant. Same with Office 365, big multi-tenant uh, um, uh, applications. Now they can be public-facing or they can be uh, corporate facing. But public facing, for instance, Facebook, huge multi-tenant, uh, even they build their own data centers, that's how big that is. But multi-tenant is the, the holy grail, that's where we wanna go. If we wanna be efficient and be able to scale to you know, um, a global and, and uh, almost you know, quote unquote infinite number of, of customers in the future. So moving into Azure, more focused, um, let's have a little look at what's in the Azure box. now. Azure has grown tremendously. I'm going to go back to the portal uh, and show you. We had the um, preview Azure portal, but there's also another portal which shows you uh, maybe an, an even better overview. This is the, um, um, the uh, current uh, Azure portal, but they're changing from this one to the, the other one that I showed you because of this long list here. It keep, keeps growing and growing. These are services in the Azure portal. You can see things like Active Directory. You can see things like content delivery networks, caching, service buses for messaging, HD Insights, storage. There are so many things in here that you can use in the cloud as a service to build your applications. Uh, you should not be running, I mean, you could, and it's perfectly fine, sometimes you need, but you, if you can, avoid to run SQL servers. You should not do that because you need to run a virtual machine with SQL Server on it. Maybe all you needed, all you ever wanted was a database. Well, you can get that database as a service in the Azure platform instead of running it yourself. When it comes to com com competitive uh, landscape, this is a very Microsoft-y slide with like tons of information on it. So I'm going to focus in here on this for a while. When it comes to the competitive landscape, when you compare the clouds to each other or different vendors that have a stake in, in cloud or cloud-like um, delivery, uh, you will note that Amazon is the leader of infrastructure as a service. Running virtual machines in the, in the cloud is what Amazon does best. And there's no doubt. I mean, Amazon are awesome at this. They are really, really good. Microsoft is gaining on them, um, but if, if you ask the analysts, uh, they are not as good as Amazon right now but certainly the gap between Microsoft and Amazon is closing in this space. That's what we've seen over the last few years. What 
What Microsoft has, on the other hand, is this, platform as a service and software as a service offerings, where you can see Amazon has almost nothing. Uh, platform as a service is going to be the way, if you ask me, going forward, the most important way to do business. And, and uh, looking at these, uh, I don't know if you've seen these, uh, these are um, uh, charts that show, um, that show, these are Gartner charts that show completeness of vision versus ability to execute on different metrics for the cloud. And you can, what you will note is that, for instance, infrastructure as a service, the ones in the leader uh, square, this is where you want to be in the upper right box, are Amazon and Microsoft, and the other ones are outside of that box. Uh, not even near as much innovative as these two. And cloud storage, same story there. Microsoft is in the leader box. And enterprise pass, Microsoft is in there. Amazon is not even on this chart at all. If you want to utilize platform as a service, I'm sorry to say, but the competitor is not in the scale at all. Google is there for enterprise pass, but Google is there for, for IaaS, so they're trailing, but the third biggest, uh, the third most competitive and biggest vendor is Google. So uh, we have Amazon, Microsoft, and Google in the lead, without a doubt. If you're looking at server virtualization, VMware and Microsoft, and so on and so on, right? <coughs> of course, I speak well about Microsoft. That's my preferred cloud. I'm a, I'm an Azure MVP. I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. You know, I love Microsoft, but my point is that I don't care about selling Azure to you, really, I don't. Uh, maybe it sounds like it right now, but I don't. I care about uh, giving you the proper solution that you need, and I know that Microsoft is, is a really, really good, in a, in a really, really good position to do that. Uh, even the quote up there in the corner uh, by uh, this Gartner woman, Lydia Alion, says that, you know, this is a very, very appealing story, very comprehensive hybrid story, spans applications and platforms, that's very attractive for, uh, if you look at it from a, from a, a, a sort of a, a business or an enterprise perspective. All right, um, there's another Microsoft slide. Currently, the, the largest VMs in public cloud are run by Microsoft. You can't get any bigger than the G series, the Godzilla size. Microsoft have recently released a thing called premium storage, gives you super fast disks, of course, based on SSDs, and I showed you the management just now. Now, this shows that there are three ways to put your applications on the cloud. Actually, there's a fourth one coming, but mostly this one to the left is infrastructure as a service, and these ones to the right are platform as a service. I want to quickly show you a chart. I don't know if you've seen this type of chart before, but it shows you that all of these things, the entire stack, is what you manage in your own data center. And all the way from the bottom with the networking all the way up to the application that you want to run and everything in between. If you move to a cloud platform, you can uh, deploy your applications in infrastructure as a service or platform as a service. The infrastructure as a service is where you rent and run virtual machines in a data center somewhere. So that means that the vendor gives you all of this. They, they give you the networking, storing, and service, servers and the virtualization stuff, but you manage everything from the operating system and up. Sometimes this is what you need, and also this is a great first step to move from on-premise to the cloud. You basically take your on-premise uh, virtual machines and you lift them. That's called, usually called lift and shift. You just lift and shift them up to the cloud and run them there instead. Already you have won a lot, uh, you know, compared to purchasing new servers yourself or maybe uh, long, prolonging uh, 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 a contract with your uh, outsourced uh, localized uh, local vendor. Um, they will not be able to match the price of the, of the cloud, without a doubt. Um, the next step up is uh, to go to platform as a service, but first I want to comment that software as a service, you know, the, what I mentioned, uh, Google Apps for your domain or your Office 365 or SharePoint Online and things like that, that's software completely run and maintained by some vendor and it's offered free to you for, for purchase. But uh, if you look at these, uh, the, the other option here in between platform as a service, that might be your sort of golden target 
uh, where you would like to be because at that point uh, when you're building applications you just have to bother about the application code and the data and nothing else that's all you need to think about uh, these two pieces here you you worry about that you you handle that and everything else is managed by the vendor automatically for you that gives you focus and takes away costs and 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 uh, other stuff that you don't want to bother about then you will build your applications and you will offer them as software as a service to somebody to purchase from you in the end. So I know I've been uber clear about this, but platform as a service is the best foundation for the future. It's where you want to be. If you're not there yet, don't worry. If it's going to take you a long time to get there, that's fine also. Uh, running infrastructure as a service is a perfectly valid scenario. Better to do that than to stay on premise, if you ask me. So step by step, piece by piece, right? Now, if I didn't sound like a Microsoft salesperson before, I'm totally going to do that now. <laughs> and this is a joke almost. <coughs> I wanted to um, be, be like, you know, you get some Azure, you get some, some Azure, and you get some Azure. Everybody gets Azure. Um, the fun part here is that this is all, you know, for free. I wanted to show you just the tools and, and how, how it all hangs together, if you will. To, to show you what a, a, a normal development environment, a modern development environment looks like. That actually starts here in Visual Studio. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to do any coding or anything. Um, this is Visual Studio, the, the product, of course, that developers use to build stuff. We have our web demo here local on my local box. I can develop it and I can make changes to it and, and release new versions. Let's say that I, I say I want to, I made some changes. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I've made some changes to the application and I, I bumped the version from 1 to 2. Next thing I want to do is, is, um, is check this in, this change. Uh, I go and see my change. It's right there, my layout page, layout page changed. Version 2, let's call it that. I'll commit that change on my local box and I'll sync it to some place. Where am I syncing it? Well. It's been, it's been synced, uh, wait a minute, I have to click sync. Right, now it's syncing. Now this change is being synced from my local development machine to somewhere else. And this somewhere else is in the cloud actually, uh, but it's inside of Visual Studio Online. Uh, this is now Visual Studio Online that I have chosen to use. And as you can see, I'm at loftysoft.visualstudio.com. Honestly, this is actually, this is free to register for any company. Anyone can register and try this out. You get five users for free and you can play with it and, and test it and, and see what you like about it or doesn't like, don't like about it and so on. Um, I created a, a Red X Web Loftysoft demo project in here. And um, I'm going to go to that project. Probably not. We're going to click again. Hello. Let's see, I'll refresh. See if I'm signed in still. Well, it seems like it's good. Hmm. Yeah, all right. Took a, took a little while. Had to wake up. All right. So here I am inside of my project space here. Uh, you can see I can work with the code. I can work with builds. I'm just going to show you that automated builds and stuff is supported and, and sort of built in to uh, Visual Studio Online. I do have another um, thing, of course, I wanted to show you in the portal, if we just quickly go back, uh, how this all connects together. Um, I had my Visual Studio online, and that will build and deploy immediately whenever I check code in. It will build and deploy my, my application and deliver it straight out into, well, in this, in this case, into the production website. So if I click on it, you guys can also browse to it if you like. But if I click on this, I browse to my uh, actual website, the uh, radixweblofty.soft.azurewebsites.net website, uh, currently in Azure. And uh, I don't believe that it, it has, um, that it has uh, deployed anything yet. Uh, my my check-in uh, probably didn't have time to do that yet, but it's coming soon. Uh, this website is also uh, silent. And so it needs to load for the first time. It's faster once it's warmed up. 
So there you go. Actually, yes, it says version two. So it's deployed the version two that I that I uh, uh, that I make, checked into my local. Make this sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, can you please start sharing your screen, please? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. I thought that was on. Oh, thank you, thank you. All right. All right, so what I was showing was that I browsed to my web application and in the in Azure at radixweb.loftysoft.azurewebsites.net, Radix, Radix Web Loftysoft, Azure Websites Net, is, is currently my, my Azure website, my website running in Azure, and as you can see, the version 2 has been deployed. The version that I, and, and you know, I'm sorry about this, this is, this is developer designed, and uh, therefore it's so beautiful. Uh, <laughs> but but I have my, my web application in Azure, and and it's automatically deploying for my local box. Now, the hybrid story is extremely important for for you guys to to understand that there is a full hybrid scenario here in the in the Azure cloud. And the hybrid scenario um, contains um, full connectivity from your your local uh, uh, on-premises data center. Uh, where you can use Azure for things like storage, backup, disaster recovery, things like that, and uh, and uh, maybe uh, you use things like Azure Backup or Azure Site Recovery to connect your on-premises servers to the cloud. When you do uh, things like long-term retention of data, where you burst out into the cloud and use services when you have like a big peak. Um, disaster recovery, you can fail over from on-premise to uh, a cloud version in, in seconds or whatever. Um, development and testing I already talked about, and slowly and surely probably you will migrate some part of your uh, local uh, infrastructure to the cloud. Uh, in the Azure Marketplace, you can find a huge number of virtual machines. Um, <coughs> Uh, ready to go with all types of, of uh, uh, servers and server infrastructure on them. Here you have, for instance, um, you know, uh, web applications, and you can run SQL Server, you can run Ubuntu Server, IBM Websphere, and many, many more. This list is, is very long. Uh, I actually had a uh, another link to show you if you want to also go um, and um, and use public uh, uh, let's see public uh, virtual machines uh, in in what's called the VM Depot. Uh, that's the uh, Microsoft Open Tech, which ha have a big uh, depot of of lots and lots of Linux servers with all kinds of setups on them, where you can just pick one and say, I want to deploy that uh, and create a virtual machine in Azure right now with this setup and just go. So there are so many things you can do in the cloud that you might not even realize, right? Now, um, there are lots of ways to store data in the cloud. I'm going to go, uh, since we had a bit of a disruption, I'm going to go past this, part, this portion quite quickly. Uh, you can store, of course, lots and lots of files in Azure. Support smooth streaming and it's secure and it's fast. This is sort of the basic, the base foundation of the cloud, if you ask me. Uh, and um, this, um, this is a very, very uh, efficient service. I use it all the time. Actually, I used it today to send my presentation from, from my machine to Jay. Uh, and um, it's, it's sort of, uh, this is where all the hard drives for the virtual machines are stored. And this is where you store lots and lots of files if you have video content or what have you. Um, I also mentioned before that you can run SQL databases in the cloud and you can get them with really, really good SLA um, of 99.99 and, and you can say with these uh, databases, uh, I want a copy of this database, exactly what it looked like, you know, 12 days and 4 hours ago, dot, and uh, you, you will just get a copy of, of the database state at that point in time. It's really, really powerful and the reason um, is that it's built on this storage that I just mentioned. Uh, whenever you save something to a SQL database, it's going to uh, save it in three different locations in different sort of power units and different racks in the data center. When every save goes to three identical copies, and <coughs> if something bad happens, it might. 
you have you know tens or of thousands or hundreds or even millions of data uh, meta uh, of of um, of um, disks. If you have uh, like millions of disks, you might um, end up with uh, with failures from time to time. If that happens, a new instance is immediately replacing the old one. So that's extremely powerful and very uh, reliable. Uh, and I would venture to say that any setup that does not have this uh, equivalence would never be as reliable. Uh, imagine your huge database server going down that you have on-premise, the, the, the biggest one you have, and the, the, the dread before that is resolved, right? Stuff is not working. Uh, of course, I want to talk uh, in the context of data about NoSQL, and <clears throat> that means today that you might not only be using SQL databases, uh, we're talking about polyglot persistence here, that you might be using other forms of storage as well. For instance, uh, a document database. There's a, an, a document database in Azure that you could use for certain scenarios where a document database might prove more useful than a SQL uh, database, a relational SQL database. So what is a document database? Well, it is a fully managed, scale, highly scalable, no SQL documentation database service. That means that it's a schema-free storage, indexing, and querying of JSON documents. That might not need, mean a whole lot to you, but honestly, if you ask tech uh, developers and tech people, it's pretty exciting. Uh, Microsoft now have one of those offerings as well, built in the cloud for the cloud. And it's really fast because it's built on SSD drives. So it's super fast. And if you look at sort of this overview with uh, lots of data services, uh, you, you will see here from the left that you could run a SQL server in a virtual machine on-premise or in Azure, or you can jump to, to running a SQL database and not, hand, not manage and maintain your virtual machines. Over here are the blobs to the right, the files that I talked about, Azure file storage. There's also a table storage, which you can think about uh, as a big, big table of data. Uh, you can store maybe millions of rows of data if you have that type of data. But the document database uh, sort of slid in between here and, and combines many features uh, from both uh, the relational database model world and the elastic schema-free data model world, world to, to create a document database, which might be useful uh, in some scenarios. And I have customers that honestly use all five of these in their, their data story, which is then, as I said, called polyglot persistence you have many data stores. Uh, time to take a breather. <laughs> I, I went a little faster after my <laughs> unfortunate mishap with connectivity. But um, I wanted to talk about sending messages, which is uh, the case in this picture, of course. Sending messages might be the most important thing that you ever do. And for that, Microsoft have the service bus, the Azure service bus, and the event hub. The event hub is, is uh, processing in the order of, you know, trillions of messages. And um, uh, this is what you would use if you have an IoT scenario. If you have many, many devices that send many, many messages, you will have a, an event hub in Azure, which will ingest and process and store these um, incoming messages, which you can then feed into things like Power BI or Hadoop, you know, HD Insight, things like that, that you can run. But you need, a first, of course, a way to ingest all these messages. Also, you could use Service Bus for very, very cool scenarios like connecting an on-premise uh, system with a cloud system without uh, any hassle almost at all. So the Service Bus is an extremely important feature. Also, uh, Azure have, have uh, started to build on, on the sort of industry standards, if you will. The Redis uh, cache is sort of an ind industry standard today. And what, what they have done in Azure, what Microsoft have done, is to build sort of a hosted version of this, which you can just tap into and run. Of course, you can, uh, you know, stand up your own servers and uh, deploy your own Redis and uh, maintain that and manage that. You could do that, but it's probably, honestly, not what you need. You need cache. You need a, a, a caching mechanism. You don't want the hassle of maintaining one. And, of course, there are many, many more in Azure. You saw the list before. I mean, we could spend days talking about this, uh, but we're not going to. We don't have the time. <laughs> um, 
because we need to talk about compliance and security and privacy as well. Um, that's part of this presentation. So let's go over to um, the Microsoft response to this, um, this concern. It's their uh, trust center. If you browse to Azure.com and you click on pricing, um, no, <laughs> and you click on support, you will come to the trust center. Um, and in the trust center, you will find everything on, on trust, everything on security, privacy, transparency, and compliance. You can just scroll down and start reading. How does Microsoft comply with X standards, right? How, how do they comply with uh, FISC or FISMA or HIPAA or ISO standards and things like that? You can read all about it here. And um, when it comes to privacy, I know there are some concerns, uh, popular concerns, if you will. You own your own data. You're, you're in control of your data. You're not losing any control by putting your data in, in a cloud platform. And then there's information on how do we respond to government and legal requests to access data. Uh, I know that's a very popular concern. It's a, uh, once you get into it, once you get into using cloud, it's not the most important thing in the world. There are a few scenarios where it's extremely important, but many scenarios are overemphasizing this. But you can read about all of that here. I mean, it's, um, Microsoft is, in this space, definitely a, a market leader, if you will, um, and doing a lot, a lot of work uh, to, to earn the trust of, of uh, their users. I also wanted to call out the Azure Active Directory. Now, whenever you have Office 365, you have an Azure Active Directory. If you have an, uh, an Azure subscription, you also have an Azure Active Directory. And you can map this to your on-premise AD <coughs> and use the same, the same um, identity control, role-based role access control all over Azure. If you go into here uh, the um, portal again and I go back to the desktop and maybe into my demo environment, I can click on the little people here and that will bring me to security and I can add maybe a new rule for security and this is tied to, if I click on add, this is tied to, um, let's say I want to add a contributor to my project, this is tied to my AD. So let's say I want to add, add some users and these are people who are in my current AD, my actual AD, I can see myself in there and, and other people, right? So uh, I could pick anyone here and, and grant that person specific access to my resource. So complete role-based access control. So now you, you can do uh, important things like maybe saying that, um, you know, developers can use the development environment, but only administrators can deploy to production. Things like that that are, of course, crucial for any business. If we go back to Visual Studio Online, to my LoftySoft tenant in Visual Studio Online, and I click in the settings here. I'm, the, of course, the admin of my own uh, Visual Studio Online. You can see down here at the bottom, it clearly says that this account is backed by the LoftySoft Azure Active Directory. So the same Active Directory that I had in the portal is also securing access to my, my uh, project and build environment. And that's extremely important also, again, for, for uh, enterprise and business scenarios that your environment is entirely secured. And uh, you have, have that with, with uh, Act, Azure Active Directory. Uh, actually, uh, they uh, celebrated a release uh, just uh, last week with Azure Active Directory and two major milestones were reached when they released uh, their B2B and their B2C uh, products or, or offerings. And what that means is B2B is business to business, enables you to integrate your applications with customers' uh, Active Directory so that your customers can manage their users and their security and their groups and everything in their Active Directory and integrate or federate with you to uh, gain access to your service uh, with their users. <coughs> And that's incredibly powerful when you think about it because um, your users uh, will be um, 
you will not have a database with your customers' usernames and, and uh, people logging into your service using a, a, a username and password or something like that. Um, that's very, very powerful and very strong to be able to keep your own developers, or sorry, your own users in your AD and your customers' users in their own AD. And it's a very appealing story to, to be able to tell your customers to say, hey, customers, guess what? When you use our service, you don't have to uh, put your, your, um, your people through the torment of having to remember a yet another username and password because we don't want that. The B2C story is um, in a similar space, but it's slightly different because it's, it's business to consumers. And uh, in this case, you will uh, be able to use um, popular social media uh, identity providers uh, such as Google and, and so forth to uh, sign in. So if you have customers that have Facebook or Google or Microsoft accounts uh, or what have you, uh, they will be able to log in uh, choose if they wish to log into your service using uh, Facebook or whatever. If they don't want to do that, they can sign up still with a username password story, except that uh, this release also includes the fact that Microsoft will handle the, all of that username password maintenance. They will uh, store that data uh, away from your application, away from your databases inside of your AD and they will also even actually give support, uh, password recovery, reset, and that sort of thing to the end users that are using your service and you don't have to bother with uh, maintaining other pe people's secrets. Because if you can avoid that, that's a really, really good thing to do. Uh, you don't want to have the burden of managing uh, another person's password if you can avoid it. And uh, with this release, there are two really good ways to do that. In fact, I would say, if you don't have anything in Azure right now, Active Directory might be the place where you actually start. You start with Active Directory and you build from there because it's a really good foundational stone. Now, I know we're a couple of minutes over, but I also missed a couple of minutes, so I'm going to keep you for a few minutes more. If you have to leave, I understand completely. And if you want to get in touch with me and have any follow-up questions because I was going really fast, um, that's okay. Um, send me an email at magnus uh, at loftysoft.com and we can talk more. <coughs> but if you have a few more minutes, I'm going to show you one last thing. And it's uh, how, how are they doing development and testing at Microsoft. They have something called the Azure Dev Test Lab, which is currently in preview uh, that we can start using soon. Um, and what it is, it's a, a worry-free self-service, if you will, uh, space that you are sort of uh, uh, set up as an administrator uh, with policies and templates and security and stuff inside of your, your Azure subscription and your dev test people can go in there and work. The cool thing is that it can get a, it can get a quota, it can get a, a number of dollars per, per uh, you know, or euros <laughs> per, per month uh, to spend so that you know the budget for the development and test environments beforehand. That's very good. So if, if the Azure cloud is, is this tropical paradise island, then the, um, <coughs> then the um, uh, dev test lab is sort of a resort on that island that you have fenced off and, and set up spe specific rules for. It's very powerful that you can do fast provisioning and uh, you can do template-based uh, deployments there. You create templates as an admin and everyone can just stamp up those templates and use them. And again, if you have like a thousand test servers to maintain. This is so much smarter. It's insane. Uh, you will have your, your test servers running in Azure and then you will use them when you need. So it kind of looks like this. Quick walkthrough. If you click on your, your lab in Azure, you can say I'd like to create a lab virtual machine. Uh, I want to click on that thing and uh, get me a Windows 8.1 version uh, server or a uh, desktop machine. Uh, pick the size of the virtual machine. I click what should be on the machine, which programs should be installed on it, all based on template deployments, repeatable until forever. Uh, you can just say I want to have these things on my machine and I can fill out the specific parameters for this thing. And here at the bottom you see it says scheduled shutdown opt-out. If you don't opt out of that, at the end of the day, whatever schedule you set, these machines will automatically stop and when they stop, they don't cost you anything. 
So you will save money by not flipping the switch, or you can do it if that's what you need for a specific machine to be opted out of that shutdown, in which case it'll run always until you manually stop it. So what happens is that then this machine will land in your list of current running machines inside of your environment. And any development can just pick up any machine and start working uh, straight away. Any tester can start a server. You know, it's really, really, really powerful. And uh, it's, it's definitely a game changer when it comes to uh, development and testing. All right. I don't think we have a lot of time for, for uh, questions and answers today. Um, we're sort of running run out of time already. Uh, but I would like to call out if you need to talk to me or to, to Radix Web about uh, maybe talking about your scenario, what you need for your company, you should definitely get in touch with us. That's, this is my business. This is what I do. I help people uh, go, go on site with people and I help them create you know, their cloud story. Uh, show them the way. So, cloud, big data, of course, and uh, IoT, messaging, that's the current game changer. That's what we're working with. These are the tools. Um, definitely cloud is disruptive technology and uh, it, it can do things that you cannot do if you don't use cloud. Uh, really, really powerful global things. And we've all seen, of course, the trend that I showed you with mobile. We're not building applications anymore. We'll be, we're building apps. The software market is shifting to apps. And uh, all of us want to be mobile with all of our apps and all of our different devices. And the way to build these things is to, to back them on a cloud platform. You have to have a cloud platform in the background to do this. So there's an opportunity here. You need to get on if you're not on already. This, is sort of <laughs> this entire presentation has been about showing you that it's not dangerous, showing you that it's not difficult. And when you do start, you should, you should actually start really small. Consider the Active Directory that I talked about. Maybe start with the Active Directory. That's a good, good way to start. Or maybe just set up a trial account and deploy an application, test it out, and, and start thinking about what your scenario and your infrastructure would be in the cloud. And then, you know, take it from there. Uh, with those words, I'm actually going to round off and say thank you for uh, being part of this presentation. Again, sorry about the technical disruption there in the middle. <laughs> you were patient enough to stick, stick around and wait for a while. I appreciate that. Um, if, again, you want to you, you reach me, my email is on the, on the screen. And, um, you know, with that, I'm actually going to say thank you guys for listening. Thank you for being with me today. Um, I hope to talk to you guys again soon.